And it looks like we are recording. Um, so uh, just, I was telling everybody on the panel here that uh, Ben, who's usually here, um, he has a pretty bad headache. I don't know if it's a migraine or whatever, but he passed the controls over to me. Uh, he's not gonna be um, coming in today. We have most of the rest of our regular crew. Um, I don't know, honestly, if I meant to pass Beth the link. Um, I don't know if Ben or I, either one did that. So sorry, Beth, um, if neither of us made that happen. Um, I'm hoping we have a couple more people show up. Um, certainly had some people say that they were interested, but uh, maybe they'll drop in. Um, so Caleb had just asked this, but just for those that uh, I know, Sam, for example, that will be watching the video. Um, today we were talking about um, finding new music. And as I like to do while it's on my mind, um, I like to announce next week the topic is going to be samples and sampling. So maybe your favorite samples and also like sampling techniques, various, anything to do with samples basically is what we'll be talking about um, next week. Um, so before uh, we sort of talk more about um, actually finding music, I'm gonna let everybody introduce themselves. And while you guys are introducing yourselves, since I know everybody, I'm gonna actually find the stuff that Sam sent me so I can give his input into the topic. So uh, Ty, I'll let you go first. All right, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Ty, AKA Fang von Rathenstein from the most metal band on earth, the Lords of the Trident. Uh, I'm a little hoarse today and quite hungover because uh, last night we did a live quarantine karaoke fundraiser for the COVID-19 relief fund. I sang quarantine for five, or I sang quarantine, I sang karaoke for five hours and a lot of people paid a, a, a lot of money to have me take um, drinks and shots uh, during it. So, you know, near the midnight 1 a.m. mark, the quarantine, the karaoke got a little, a little sloppy and, uh, you know, but I'm alive somehow. I'm still actually alive and I'm here and I'm excited to be here. Awesome. That's, I think <laughs> sloppy karaoke is a, uh, a pretty common variety of karaoke. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I mean, you know, we, we knew that it was going to get worse and more funny as the night went yeah. on, you know, it was yeah. just going to, and it did, it definitely did. <laughs> All right. Caleb, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Caleb. And, uh, what was the, I guess, uh, I don't know, just been practicing playing guitar and, and, uh, things like this. And, I gave the dog a bath this morning. That was the big excitement today. <laughs> Victor, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Victor, and I'm trip hop producer from Kazakhstan. You know, Victor, I big, would, big hater of guitar music. <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking that. Your thing in the background was uh, last week was a Zoom background, but it looks like it's like a painting or something. Um, is it actually like one of the Zoom things on a green screen behind you, or is that a painting? The buildings back back there. No, it's my wallpaper. Ah, uh, so it is. It is actual this wallpaper. My, my actual room. Yeah, yeah. So see, last week I totally thought you had like a Zoom thing back behind you. Uh, <laughs> was the angle was a little bit different. Um, Ty, uh, I, I wanted to ask earlier, um, did you have like a cap on how many drinks that people could pay for? <laughs> nope, nope, probably should have, but no. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was one of those things where it was like, hey, it's all for charity. So um, yeah. and I, I explicitly told people, I'm like, you know, we will go uh, until one of two things happens. Either I run out of songs, because I had a big list. I had a list of like 35 or so songs and a bunch of people suggested some additional songs, which I, I, I also did, but I said, you know, we'll go until I run out of songs or until I'm too drunk to stand. And, uh, you know, I think, I think we ran out of songs first, my, my constitution <laughs> yeah. held up, but it was getting, you know, around the 1am mark, it was getting very, very close. Yeah. All right. So, so too drunk to stand. That's, that's a limit. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah. um, Maybe you know, it's like if you put yourself in the hospital, maybe it's the best like COVID like relief right. situation. Right. So. Yeah, that's kind of what we thought. It's like, yeah, we're, we're raising money for COVID-19 relief, not so that I get COVID-19. We're not going yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. 
no. you know, and I'm, I'm really, I'm, re I'm enjoying this, this these zoom calls because I'm, I'm rocking this quarantine hair and it's just like, I look like an emo kid from the nineties. I'm like, mom, take me to hot topic, the new bullet, <laughs> <laughs> the, the new, the new, the new CDs out and I got to go buy it. Uh, bullet for my Valentine. Yeah. I'm sorry. Cecilia. <laughs> uh. All right, so the reason why I asked you specifically, Ty, um, to come on this week was because you run a festival called Mad with Power, um, and I'll let you talk a little bit about that. But, um, and also, um, like, how do you find bands for Mad with Power Fest? Yeah, so um, for, for people who are not familiar with Mad with Power Fest, um, it is uh, basically a, a festival, a, a power metal, heavy metal, uh, and thrash metal festival here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, in August. And it combines two of my thing, two of my most favorite things in the entire world, uh, heavy metal and arcade games. Um, and pinball, I, I would say pinball sort of uh, falls under the, the category of that too. So what we do is we rent out a venue here in Madison have a big, you know, about 400, 500 capacity venue. It's a larger, you know, larger venue in the, in the city. And we take all the available wall space and we fill it chock full of free play arcade and pinball games. Um, and then we pull in some of the best power metal, thrash metal and heavy metal bands from all over the country and sometimes all over the world. Uh, for a big giant festival, and it is—it's so much fun. Um, if if that if people listening or watching, uh, if that seems like something that's interesting, you know, to you, if you want to come enjoy the festival, uh, MadWithPowerFest.com. Uh, we have tickets available now. And uh, and to answer your question about where I find bands, the first couple of years um, of Mad with Power Festival were actually made up of uh, of bands that that we had toured with, we had played with, or, or, you know, that were very close friends of ours. We, we, we play around my band, Lords of the Trident. We play around a lot. We tour around a lot and we run into, uh, you know, like-minded bands and, um, and, and bands that, you know, just kind of in out of the blue will um, just make us turn our heads and go like, Whoa, this is, a, this is a great band. So we, we wanted to start the festival small uh, because we wanted to grow it you know, slowly um, to the point where we, we didn't have to worry too much about, about general ticket sales. We, we, so this is kind of comes from, I have a friend who, uh, a couple friends actually who've run festivals in the past and they kind of started too, too big. You know, they, they started with like three days and 75 bands and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And they didn't really have the name recognition there yet. So I started small. I started with one day. We did, you know, six, seven bands, kind of built it up. Um, this year we're doing, you know, two days uh, and we've got um, more bands. I think uh, 11 or 12 or maybe, okay. <laughs> with, with all this COVID-19 stuff, it's actually been a while since I've like really like sat down and thought about, you know, all of the logistics at, but, um, but yeah, so, so it started out, you know, with just, uh, sort of friend bands, as you could call them. Uh, and then as the festival grew, as we did more PR, as more and more people came to the fest and said, wow, this is awesome. You know, I'm coming back next year. There's, there's nothing really, there's nothing really like this, you know, in the United States, uh, an arcade and pinball and heavy metal festival. Nobody's really doing that. Um, so as the, as the PR grew, we, uh, we started, you know, getting emails from people. We started accepting, um, uh, you know, basically solicitations from other bands who wanted to come uh, and play the festival. And so I actually have a, a Google form set up on the website for bands that are interested in playing the fest where they can put in all their information, you know, YouTube, uh, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, the whole, the whole shebang. Uh, and I've actually amassed quite a quite a good, you know, list of bands from all over the world, uh, where I can, you know, in one place where I can kind of like listen to music and, and check them out. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, a lot of where I find bands for the festival is, is people using that form, A. Uh, B, it's, you know, bands that are active and that we go out and play with, you know, so we still pull in 
uh, bands that we are friends with, we are fans of, <laughs> and uh, and have them come play the festival. Um, and then I think C, you know, we also we also just from from sources on the internet, from sources on Facebook, from people posting. Um, you know, information about, oh, you know, this record's coming out or that record's coming out. We have bands that are kind of just naturally on our radar, bands that we sort of naturally um, know about because the general sort of heavy metal community at large has created a bit of a buzz about, you know, this band or that band or whatever. So, um, so that's kind of the third way that we find uh, bands. And um, a lot of people ask, you know, a lot of bands, We'll say, oh, you know, hey, do you have any openings this year or whatever? Um, for for our festival, and I think actually for most festivals, we usually are in terms of like the 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 thought process of like, okay, what bands are we going to have on the fest? We're usually um, a, a year ahead, right? So I have all the bands booked for this this year's fest, and that was pretty much done and settled around December of last year, right? Um, and as of right now, I actually have a, a short list, you know, we'll call it, of bands that I, of, you know, day one, day two for next year uh, that I think is probably doable. Now, you know, there's going to be a little bit of fluctuation on that. Uh, and we'll have, you know, possibly some room if a band drops or if this happens or that happens. Uh, but generally for most, you know, festivals, I think most people are planning their fests uh, at, at least a year in advance. I know, I know, I certainly am. Um, what about headliners? Do you, do you specifically go out or do you just get people enough that are coming in and you're like, okay, these guys are the headliners. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a, you know, I, I've made a gigantic list of probably 60 or 70 bands that, and then I've sort of on that list, I've sort of categorized them into like, okay, here's, here's the ones that are, that I feel are headliner worthy. Here's like the, the B grade, here's the C grade, you know, kind of a stuff. And, um, you know, in terms of what makes a band a headliner uh, for a festival, I think any festival will tell you, I mean, the number one thing is is draw and buzz. You know, are they going to sell tickets? Uh, are people going to be excited about seeing them live? You know, if, if you get a band, if you get a band that doesn't do a whole lot of live shows, um, that's that creates a buzz, and they could theoretically potentially be a headliner. Um, last year, we had the band Judicator, uh, who are great friends of ours, uh, and I've been doing a, a bunch of stuff actually with um, their lead singer, uh, John Yellen. We do a um, power metal uh, opera battles over Skype. We have a YouTube series that we do that. Um, but you know, Judicator doesn't play a lot of live shows because they're a scattered band. They're you know this guys. Uh or in Arizona and Florida, is that right? Well, so sort of, yeah. One of them is in Salt Lake City. One of them's in Phoenix. Uh, and then one of, they, they just got a new basis. So one of them's now in California. <laughs> and one of them just moved to Ohio. So they're everywhere. They're across the entire country. So they don't really get it. They're not centralized like we are. And they don't usually get a chance to do um, shows. So a lot of people, especially in the power metal community, are very excited when they see, oh, Judicator is actually playing a, they're actually on a festival. We have to see this. Like, when are we gonna ch get a chance to see Judicator again? So that was um, that was a big draw for us last year. Um, you know, I, I think you ask pretty much anybody, you, you show them the list, and I think uh, anybody who is sort of entrenched in the, the heavy metal or power metal world can look at and say, okay, uh, Unleash the Archers, clearly a headliner. Um, you know, Visigoth clearly a headliner um you know immortal guardian clearly a headliner kind of a thing so you can you can look at, at at certain bands and you can say okay well they've been around forever they've played prog power they have you know thirty thousand facebook followers and and uh, they're touring the country with marty friedman yeah okay they're probably a probably a headliner <laughs> I actually have a, a few more questions that I'm, I'm curious about with the uh, Matt with Power Fest. Um, but uh, strictly speaking, the topic is not the Matt with Power Fest. It's yeah. finding new music. So uh, I wanted to, to let Caleb and Victor um, jump in. And, um, you know, if you guys had anything that you wanted to, I mean, if you guys have questions for Ty, feel free to, to, uh, to ask them. But if you guys want to talk about, um, I mean, as anybody who's seen these or attended these, we have a topic, but it's like, 
you know, like the whole idea is like to get people together and like just chat and have some fun. So we're not, we're not like the topic is, is a, it's a winding, it's path. a framework really, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, did you guys want to ask Ty anything or say anything about finding music, Caleb or Victor? Uh, if you I could can you in the oh, chat, sorry. that'd be nice. Yeah. I didn't hear that actually. Oh, uh, if you could put some uh, links into the chat to his festival, that'd be great. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Yeah, and I, I, I will say uh, that uh, Judicator is great. Um, I don't know when, at what point they uh, they found they got a label at some point and they stopped doing Creative Commons stuff. Um, which uh, you guys are kind of. Uh, kind of doing some creative commons, some not creative commons. Um, yeah, we've done a little bit uh, here and there. Uh, it's, you know, a good, go ahead, you were gonna ask something. Oh, I was just saying, like, I know that the, uh, like the, um, the acoustic one um, that came out as creative commons. So. Yeah, yeah. So the, the um, and, and, and some of our old, some of our older stuff was creative commons. So the, the, the issue was, especially with the new, uh, especially with the new um, albums, is that uh, you know we, we I, I love the idea of Creative Commons, um, and uh, you know I, I I would I would like um, more labels to be okay with the idea of Creative Commons. But um, one of the one of the main things that we wanted to do with our last album, Shadows from the Past, was to shop it to a uh, Japanese uh, label. Uh, so that we could do a tour of Japan. Um, I speak Japanese, my wife speaks Japanese. Uh, my lead guitarist and best friend is half Japanese. We have a lot of ties to Japan. And we've been over, you know, to Japan as a, just, you know, for, for fun, uh, many, many times. And we have a lot of friends that live there. We have a lot of host family over there. So, um, you know, we know the we know the language, we know the culture, we know how to get around, and we kind of know where the hotspots are. And we've been saying for years, oh, man, wouldn't it be super fun if we could just, you know, if we could just go over there and, and, and play a show for all of our friends and fans over there who've never really gotten a chance to see us live. Um, and then, you know, have a, have a little bit of a vacation, take some, take some dips in the hot springs, you know, from here and there and everywhere. Um, so the issue was is that, you know, when we were talking about it with, uh, with some of the labels, very, very, uh, very, very shy about the whole Creative Commons aspect. And they, you know, a lot of a lot of them don't have a clear view and a clear idea of exactly what it is, and exactly how it works. And, um, you know, not to be stereotypical, but a lot of these guys are sort of entrenched in like the, the old way of of doing music and the old way of making money off of music and they're really hesitant about anything new and anything that they don't that they don't understand or that they can't you know theoretically see a way to like to make money off of basically yeah you know so um so the the issue is is that um anything that we're shopping any any major release you know that we're shopping around to um overseas record labels europe uh japan anything like that um unless they specifically sign us and then give the okay to say, yeah, make it creative commons. You know, it, it's, it's a very risky proposition because you don't want to have that asterisk on there saying like, yeah, you know, we're available to be signing, but you know, that kind of a thing. So while, while I, you know, I fight for the, for the opportunity to make those, to make that music creative commons and to make people, you know, basically be able to use it. Cause I mean, let's face it. I mean, like why else are we making music if people can't, you know, turn around and, and, and be inspired by it and create something with it. Um, but you know, you have to kind of play ball with a lot of these old, old guard type of people. And that can be, that could be a real difficult, difficult proposition. Yeah. That, and uh, the Japanese market is like, you have to have like I think at least a couple of tracks that uh, aren't anywhere else. Yeah, uh, and so interestingly like, enough, like the the reason a lot of people wonder about that, like why is there, why is there these 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 Japan only bonus tracks? And the reason is is that um, you know if you think about it, right, in the United States, I mean, transport yourself back to you know 1990, right, and you're you're walking into a record store 
and you're going to buy a CD, how much is that CD going to cost? You, you'd probably say, uh, you know, 10 bucks, 12 bucks, maybe something like that, right? And then fast forward to today in 2020, I mean, there's not really record stores too much anymore, but you know, you walk into a place that sells CDs, how much is a brand new CD going to cost you if they even have it? How much is that going to cost you? I mean, 15, you know, maybe 20 if it's a nice one. And, and so like the CDs haven't really kept up with in inflation. The prices of CDs are roughly the same as they were, you know, back in the day. Uh, and, and if you, if you kept track of inflation, right, a CD nowadays, uh, an album should probably cost you 40 bucks, 45 bucks, right? Um, whereas in Japan, they have always kept their media prices up with inflation. So if you walk into a, Jap a Japanese record store, and there are a lot of Japanese record stores still, um, they love their physical media. Uh, if you walk into a, 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 a record store and you buy a new CD, a brand new CD that just came out today, you're probably going to be paying 40, 50, sometimes 60 bucks for that brand new CD that came out. And so, you know, the Japanese record executives aren't stupid. They, they, they realized that a fan of, let's say Metallica, right? A fan of Metallica in Japan could buy a U.S. edition of their latest record and have it shipped all the way over to Japan, you know, even with the fastest rate, and they would still be paying probably $5 less than if they walked, you know, a block down to their local Sam Goody or whatever and picked up a, a copy of the CD. So the reason that there's those Japanese bonus tracks and the reason that uh, American bands need to have additional bonus tracks is because that's how they entice the Japanese consumer to actually buy the Japan edition. You know, they say, okay, yeah, you could spend $35 and get the U.S. edition. But if you buy the Japanese edition, you get two tracks that nobody else in the world gets to hear. And the booklet also is completely translated into Japanese, so you can read it. That's another one of the stipulations, you know, to be signed to a, a, a label. So you got to translate all your stuff. So, um, so that's, that's why. Uh, and that's another thing that makes it kind of sticky, right? Because with Creative Commons, uh, because uh, one of the stipulations, you know, in the contracts that you get on these record labels is that, um, you know, you can't, you can't release these bonus tracks like on Bandcamp or on YouTube or, you know, you, you, you can't sell them outside of Japan. They have to be only for the Japanese market. Um, you know, and you'll see some people that'll, uh, that'll, that'll buy a Japanese edition and then they'll, they'll rip the, the songs and put them up on YouTube and hopefully they won't get copyright striked and, you know, take down, but the band itself, right. The entity, the legal entity of the band can't, can't do that. So that's, that's basically the gist of the whole Japanese record label scheme. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, record stores and uh, they're, we'll just say decline, certainly a decline from at one point. Um, but record store day was supposed to be in April and they pushed it back to, to June 20th, I think is still the official date, but like now I've see they've got this thing on the website. Of course I'm looking on, on my phone. Um, so maybe it's not laid out the same, but um, they've got, Record store day drops um, scheduled for August 29th, September 26th, mm -hmm. and on October 24th. Um, so I don't know if that June 20th date is just completely gone now or if that's an additional date. But um, we've got – Black Sonic's got um, a couple of different things that are supposed to come out, but I don't know um, – I don't know when, like if that's the June 20th date. And I don't think I'm supposed to talk about – those yet but maybe i don't know <laughs> i don't know because it's all weird because it's like it was already supposed to have happened well so the deal with record store day is that record store day gets to do all the they get the like the announcement press mm -hmm. like, they have to make the announcement and i really don't i th i think they already announced but um i don't know if they like I mean, I guess it's like if you announce and then you pull the page because everything's weird, like it's the internet. It didn't really, like it still happened. Like, mm -hmm. so, but I don't know how that works. But, um, but anyway, I, eventually we have a couple of things that are supposed to come out. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. We haven't we haven't had to deal. Um, we, uh, I don't know what traffic does. That's our distributor as far as the Japan stuff, but we haven't had any um, additional bonus tracks that we've done for Japan. So. Sure, sure. But, yeah, and and some smaller labels are okay with you know not having the the tracks. Um, and just kind of re-releasing it, um, you know. I'm, I think I'm more talking about like the the major labels, the, the ones that would provide some form of tour support. Um, yeah. Over there, it, it, that's that's the other weird thing about the Japanese market um, for for live shows uh, is that you know in in Europe and in the United States, we're very used to having like a bar that's a venue where you can just call them up and be like, yo, uh, I'm in Lords of the Trident. We're coming by on, you know, Thursday, December 4th, you guys have an opening and they'll be like, yep, you know, you're, you're on in Japan since space is at a premium, they don't have a whole lot of like bar venues. They have some, but they don't have a ton like we do. Um, and so, especially in larger cities like Tokyo and Nagoya and all those places, um, you will have what's called a, a live house where you, uh, it's basically just a room that has a back line. So you get, you know, some amps and a drum set and you will rent it out for the night for like 500 bucks. And then you make your money back. Hopefully you make your money back by uh, selling tickets to your friends to come see the show. Um, and so like all of the, all of the financial impetus is on the bands. And so for for a for a band from the United States, without uh, without label support over there, right? Um, it would be basically like we'd be finding some local bands, and we'd be like, "Hey, uh, could you put five hundred dollars down on this live house for the show? Oh, and could you also sell all the tickets to your friends? And also, could when we show up, we're just gonna take most of the money because we're on tour? Is that okay? You know, like." my Midwestern niceness, my sense of Midwestern niceness does not allow me to do that. Like we need some sort of like financial backing. We need, we need a label to, to at least pay for the live house so that we don't have to put the impetus, impetus on like these other bands. You know what I mean? Yeah. That makes yeah. Sense. I, um, it's almost the same stuff in here. Really? But yeah, but except paying artists. So huh. you need to pay artists. What? What the hell? <laughs> I don't know if that actually worked. Um, I'm gonna try to copy. I'm gonna copy and paste uh, the links that Sam sent into the um, into the chat here. I think. Yeah, yeah, that that worked. I actually don't. I'm not familiar with some of these. This. Um, Aguier, Aguier, I don't know. It's a blog spot, um, MP3 blog, I guess. Um, recent music heroes is their tagline. So sounds mm. like uh, new releases. Um, this NetWaves um, thing, which I'm about to drop in the chat, um, it's uh, I did the same thing where I I copied the link instead of uh, the text, but it, this one's simple actually. It's netwaves.org, you know, two English words without any dashes or anything in between them, netwaves.org. Um, and they actually seem to have like a, like a legit radio um, thing going on. And, um, but it is a, their, their sort of blurb is, uh, NetWaves is a constant changing concept consisting of different projects. They have um, the, the weekly um, radio program, um, and it, it's a podcast that specializes in electronic music of all kinds, um, which I've always found the, the calling things electronic music to be strange. Like, I know what that means when people say it, but it's like electric, electric guitars are electronic <laughs> like i don't know it's a weird word to me but um they have a uh, netwaves.bpm the it's a djing part of the netwaves um with mixes and live shows and then netwaves also has a um a uh, a net label that's associated with them and um they have a uh this is in belgian i guess um uh kopi fest something like that um, it's a, uh, Belgian net label showcase that they do as well. So lots going on. Um, 
on netwaves.org. Uh, and then uh, one of the ones that, um, that I actually was going to mention too is uh, Klong Klong Moo. Um, specifically, um, Klong Klong Moo has a, um, a net labels like database. It's pretty funny um, because uh, they lump like all of um, like popular music, I guess, kind of together. Um, so they have, uh, I think six different, I mean, it tells you something about the net label scene, but they have six different like genres, we'll just call them, you know, ways that they break things down and then, and they're color coded. I guess I'll drop this link so people can see the pretty colors. Um, Oh, I didn't actually drop that one. Let me, so there's, there's the Kwong Kwong Moo. Um, and it's got defunct net labels and current. Um, so it depends on like, you know, do you want to find new stuff or do you want to find, you know, do you care? Um, you know, obviously if you're, you know, looking for people to play a show, then you don't want, you're not going to be looking at the dead, uh, the dead net labels. Right. Right. But, um, but so the green is, acoustic rock jazz and heavy metal that's like one of their genres <laughs> but uh, that's, one of the, that's a that's a lot yeah that's, yeah one of them is uh game music chip tune eight bit and lo-fi um electronic idm glitch and ambient is another one and then uh breakbeat hip-hop sampling drum and bass they put together experimental noise sound field recording i mean those all those all make sense together to me um or one and then dense techno house and breakcore um i mean all of those kind of make some sense once you look at the six that they have but it's like man you know that is not the way people normally <laughs> break down genres right. um, and they don't they, i guess i don't know where you would put like um so uh new focus recordings is like a contemporary classical um net label um, or at least I would call them a net label. I mean, they're, they're a band camp page essentially, but, um, you know, they're, I don't know if they're on here, but, um, you know, they're not a band and they have a band camp page that releases music from other bands. That's a net label, right? Yep. I mean, so, um, yeah, they're, they're not on here, but, uh, I don't know. Maybe one of the, the prereqs is that you have to be on this list is that you have a, um, your own, uh, web page and not just Bandcamp. I don't know, but uh, but in any case, it's like where where would contemporary classical go? I mean, I think it would it almost it would have to either fit into with jazz or uh, <laughs> or or the experimental. Like it would have it have to be one of those, I would think. But right. Um, I mean, unless but, you wrote wrote a dance, you know, contemporary classical. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, again. Wow, this Baroque like, beat is really hitting me. I'm loving well, it. You know, and I'm it's like, like get that harpsichord, uh, turn it up. Well, I mean, ballet, <laughs> ballet is a dance. So, uh, you know, and of course, like waltzes and, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that are, um, that are dances, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, not the way we generally, generally break things up in, uh, 2020. Um, but it's interesting because, um, you, and they do, they do let Nate labels be, you know, like in multiple categories. So they're not like, oh, this this net label is just this, um, but they've got their six. And I guess it kind of makes sense because it's like, you know, you only have but so much space on a page, you know, if you want to do 27, then it gets kind of hard to like visualize. With six, you can just eyeball it and see where everything is at. But um, one thing that uh, am amuses me um, is that uh, Block Sonic has actually found themselves um, to occupy all six of the genres. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, working overtime there. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I could see it. Um, you know, we're we're certainly a little wider in some of the categories than in others, but um, it's like, yeah, okay, we've got all of that stuff. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like, it, this is one of those pages that, like, um. You know, this is like starting on Wikipedia on like, you know, I don't know, the War of 1812 article and like <laughs> clicking on every link that, you know, until you've exhausted all the links. I mean, like th this is like you're never going to get through 
all of the stuff um, that is here. So, um, and they, uh, oh, one thing I just noticed is that they mark, um, I don't know how long they keep them in this category, but when there are new um, net labels, they mark them as new. So there's, there's dead, new, and then just. Yeah, I'm seeing that. So, um, so that's so many. Dead yeah, <laughs> it is absolutely bonkers how many they are. And like I was saying, like, I personally know of ones that aren't on here. So like, I mean, there's, you know, there's probably at, at least as many that are not on here as are, but, um, you know, you have to get, I would say, I would think, you know, a certain amount of notoriety before they're going to, I mean, you know, you release, you call yourself a net label and you put out one album. I mean, like, okay. The, yeah. But, uh, but, but new focus recordings is not, not in that category. I mean, they're, they're releasing stuff all the, all the time. Um, it's, um, I should, I should email them and, and actually have them put on there. Cause, uh, unless their rule is like, uh, yeah, we can't actually, they may call themselves a collective. Uh, hmm. I'm going to look this up because that may be, that may be the sticking point, um, for, for them. But, you know, I would say like kind of, I mean, it's not like they're, it's not like all of these people are like playing on these albums. So, I mean, it's a collective in some sense, but yeah, they do call themselves an artist led. Well, they saw themselves an artist led collective label. That's what they say. So, um, I don't know, but they got like crazy amount of, uh, of, uh, releases. I'll, I'll drop, I don't think I dropped the new focus recordings link I, on, on here. So, um, Oh, um, so Caleb was asking about, um, Vicky. Uh, I think that, uh, my mom wanted to listen and that one week we didn't record. So, um, <laughs> so she's just, uh, Hi, mom. In. Yeah. Oh, your mother. <laughs> yeah. Um, 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 she's the, um, <laughs> with, along with my dad, they're the, uh, last year they did, um, I think what's called the Southeast region which is not actually doesn't actually include the most southeast portion of the country um it's like tennessee kentucky west virginia it really should be called like appalachia is what that region should be called but um uh, but the way that so what we did with the the cc community music awards is um when we started for the u.s we just took the james beard regions um so james beard is like the uh, they do cooking Dude. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but they, but I knew their region list reason well. And we were just like, we're just going to use that because we have to start somewhere. We're going to try to break it down. Hopefully we can get enough people to do that. Um, but break it down um, a little bit more granularly next year. But, um, but anyway, yeah. So what they call the Southeast um, <laughs> includes the, the Carolinas and um, you know, some of the Apple, the, basically where the Appalachians go up through like, you know, not Pennsylvania, everything south of that. Um, but this this year, uh, I found somebody else to do that region, and they do the south, which um, is Louisiana, um, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, um, Florida, and Puerto Rico, I believe. Off the top of my head is what that region is. So, um, And then, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, that's one thing that, um, you know, it's sometimes hard to uh, – you know, when we're, when we're doing the CC um, Community Music Awards, you know, we're looking for something very specific, you know, must be Creative Commons, must be released this year. So, and then with the regions, you know, it's a third stipulation. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, that, that's sort of an interesting thing with the festivals, the festivals too, the whole regionality. And you talk, you know, I, I assume that a lot of the bands with Mad, um, Mad With Power they do come from the Midwest because it's just cheaper to get there. Well, um, and people uh, know them. Uh, initially, uh, for the first year, uh, yeah. But actually, uh, for the for 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 after the first year, we've had bands from uh, from literally all over. We had um, a couple bands from California uh, last year. Uh, we had a band from uh, Washington D.C. come in. We had. Um, uh, uh, we yeah for we had a, we had a band from Canada that was gonna gonna come and they they ended up breaking up 
right uh. <laughs> right before it. But um, yeah, at this point, uh, we're we're lucky enough that Matters Power has uh, gotten enough notoriety at the moment that not only are we um, not only are we having uh, bands from all over the country and sometimes all over the world, we're all we're also having fans uh, yeah. fly in from everywhere we're, we have a we have a couple of people coming in from europe this year we had a yeah. guy from japan uh you well, know fan, okay fans makes more sense to me traveling than a band because yeah. you have to get the, everybody in the band unless you know unless you're a one person fan um and you have to you have to fly all your stuff yeah i mean that's not cheap no and you know that that is a big uh chunk of where the money goes uh in terms of ticket sales um we don't you know, we're, we're not really running Mad with Power Fest uh, as a, as like a for-profit type of business at the moment. Uh, a lot of everything that we make uh, for, from ticket sales either goes directly to the bands or goes back into the festival, you know, to make uh, better quality shirts or to, you know, allow uh, people to have more food options or stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I, I'd love to be able to grow the festival to the point where, you know, it's something like Prague Power where we just don't have to worry about it. Like, is it going to sell out or not? You know, where we go like, oh, no matter who we put on it, it's going to sell out. It's a yearly thing. Everybody comes. <laughs> who cares? You know, I, I'd love to get to that point where we could, you know, probably start seeing, um, you know, a, like a, like a personal monetary return on investment. Uh, but, but, you know, at this point it's, it's a lot of, it's basically just a lot of fun. It's a great vehicle to get a lot of friends together in the same place at the same time. And it's a wonderful vehicle to allow uh, bands to play in front of, you know, a, a hardcore audience for them uh, and, and grow their business too. Um, Judicator actually, uh, John had, you know, mentioned this, to me and, and on his podcast many times, you know, he said Judicator had never played uh, a sold out show before ever. Uh, and Mad with Power Fest was their first time, you know, playing a, a, a completely, totally, completely packed place that was 100% sold out. Um, and, that, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a neat experience to be able to give to somebody, um, you know, to, to be able to play, uh, to be able to put on a festival and allow these bands to, to be able to say like, yeah, we played a sold out festival. I mean, that's, you know, that's cool. It's cool. So, so yeah, I, I, a a lot of bands do fly in. I think um, a majority of, we, we try to pick bands where we, you know, where we know that they're savvy enough or they're active enough to say, okay, we're going to go play Mad with Power Fest on August 15th let's do like a five day yeah. like mini tour where we drive there and back. I mean, that's what Nova rain did. That's what Helian prime did. Um, you know, last year, uh, where they're not just flying in for one show because yeah, that's prohibitively expensive. Uh, there's a couple bands, you know, who sh- a couple of not, I, 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 they're not larger bands. They're maybe more well known who shall remain nameless, you know, who, who, who asked for like, we want four grand to play and we want you to cover all of our uh, plane tickets and hotels. It's like, yeah, dude, no, like the, the, <laughs> the fest only brings in, you know, I mean, if you, if you look at the numbers, the fest really only brings in, I mean, maximum, you know, like 12,000 ish dollars. So we have that to play with and that's got to cover all, you know, the cost for all the bands. It's got to cover the cost for food. It's got to cover the cost for merch. It's got to cover the cost for giveaways. We do, we do a whole ton of giveaways, you know, like, like I said, we're not trying to, we're, we're trying to build this and we're trying to use this as a vehicle for, for press and PR and to give people an opportunity to play in front of people. We're not, we're not really running this as a, in, in, in a very savvy business sense quite yet where we're like, yes, we'll add in the convenience fee to our tickets and <laughs> skim off the top. Yes. Good. You know, we're not doing that. In fact, um, mad with power fest, the, the, one, that's the one thing I hate about buying tickets online, you know, is that those like stupid, you know, you, you buy a $30 ticket and it comes with like a, a $20 convenience fee. You're like, what? D- no, no. You know? So for mad with power, uh, for th- from this day and until the end of time, Mattis Power will never ever have any convenience fees. We eat the cost of that 
uh, directly because I hate them so much. So, you know, we lose a little bit of money on every ticket sale from eating those fees, but it's a better end result, you know, for the consumer, for the people that are coming to see it. If they see, you know, going to Mad with Power is $30 or going to Mad with Power is $20 or going to Mad with Power is $50, it's going to be $50 at, check at checkout. It's not going to be, you know, sixty five ninety nine. It's not going to be anything like that. It's going to be the, the price that you pay. So, so yeah, um, that, you know, long meandering answer to that one. <laughs> well, how um, do you try to help out the bands? So, you know, a lot of the Mad with Power is focused um, and will always be focused on uh, bands that are up and coming and, and you know, maybe uh, underrepresented is maybe not the right way to put it. But um, the, the, the thing that I see happening, especially, especially in heavy metal, the thing that I see happening is um, in the United States, you know, over in Europe, you see this too, but it's, it's, it's more a problem in the United States. You see heavy metal festivals that ignore, uh, you know, mid-tier bands, um, like, like Judicator, like Helium Prime, bands that, you know, might be signed to a label, but they're not like Iron Maiden. They're not Judas Priest. They're not, who you is? know, Metallica. <laughs> who, exactly, who is? And that's the problem. Every festival that I have that I have gone to, for the most part, in the United States, uh, that is that is heavy metal focused, they they pull in these bands with these members that are like seventy years old, and they're base they basically have like oxygen tanks on on <laughs> stage with them, you know. And I've seen and I've gone to these festivals for ten plus years, and I've seen this happen, and and every year this happens, and every year those mid tier bands don't get the chance to perform on these stages and the and so so my my thought process is dude in 20 years all of these bands will be dead or they will be so old that they literally cannot pick up a guitar and be on stage anymore um you know i keep thinking about that about the rolling stones but here they are they keep <laughs> i mean going. <laughs> i was just gonna say the rolling you know rolling stones non-withstanding right but you know you have seen a lot of these bands call it quits you have seen a lot of these bands start doing their fare farewell tours and stuff like that and and i feel like the festival scene has done a really poor job of uh cultivating the next you know sort of the next up and comers uh, I'm not saying, you know, let's give every single band that, that's in a garage, you know, right now that has a three song demo that they recorded in their parents' basement, a spot on Mad With Power Fest. But what I am saying is, you know, let's pay attention to some of the bands that are that have been around for a couple of years, are touring, are putting out good material, but they're not getting that opportunity that chance that exposure to play in front of a sold out crowd to play in front of a festival crowd that's specifically there to see your genre um you know i'll, I'll tell you guys i mean mad with power fest was started out of spite a hundred percent because we had two major festivals two major festivals where we were invited to play the festival and then at the last minute, the rug got pulled out. Oh, oh, uh, uh, you know, oh, we missed your email where you accepted. Um, oh, something came up. Uh, we can't, uh, you know, we'll do it next year. The next year rolls around and you're like, okay, so we're going to do it. Oh, yeah, something, something came up this year. We can't, we can't do it. Well, next year though, next year we'll have you on for sure. You know, or they straight up will say, you know, we've got you on the main stage this year. And then they will forget that they said that kind of a thing. So there, there are a lot of bands that, that, that try to get on these festivals and are straight up ignored, you know, and, and in, in favor of these older bands that, you know, yeah, they were cool back in the eighties, but like, does anybody really, they, they haven't put out an album in 30 years. Does anybody really care uh, about, you know, about them anymore? I mean, I'm sure they, they do, but you know, like they're not, they're not moving the genre forward. You know, they're not in the thick of it right now. And, and trying to create and, and make a masterpiece. I think these festival people are waiting for like some band to come out of the blue and sell a million records, uh, like with overnight with no PR. It's like, well, that doesn't happen, you know? So you need to be able to have a vehicle to put these bands that are up and coming and get them in front of, you know, maybe a hundred people at the fest have heard of Judicator, but maybe yeah. the 250 other people 
have never heard of them before. And now, boom, they put on a good show and they are fans. And then Judy Cater grows. Then, then maybe now they have the exposure to approach, uh, you know, this other festival that had snubbed them in the past and be like, hey, you know, we just played sold out Mad with Power Fest. We have, you know, a, a ton more people on our Patreon. We've got, a, you know, a thousand more Facebook likes, whatever that, you know, means in the long run. I mean, you know, so, so that's the, the, the way that we, that's the way that we help out the bands. And also, you know, the, since, since I'm in a band that, that, that tours and plays a lot and, and is on the road a lot, we, we are one of the, the few, you know, festivals and places, smaller festivals, I'll say, I'll say that pay the bands up front in cash you know, when they walk in the door, they get the money. And that's how, that's how it works, you know, because that's how I feel it should work. Um, because that's fair. Um, we, we find them a place to stay. We give them, uh, we, we, I cook, I cook all the band's breakfast, uh, the next morning. I make this gigantic spread. You know, we, we try to treat the fest and treat the bands as kindly as we can, because we have been there. You know, we know what being on the road is like. We know very viscerally, <laughs> what what sleeping in some dude's weird basement that smells like cat urine is like we know that right so we try to give them the opportunity to to have a better experience than sleeping on a concrete floor or you know something like that i mean you know so so we try to be as kind to the bands uh to the performers as humanly possible how does the you're uh per, currently the power uh festival is done inside a building right yep. instead of outside and what time of the year is it done at uh it's done in august it's done kind of middle of august oh. um so that we have the opportunity for people to you know to go out and have a smoke or go out and get some food outside or whatever and just just kind of we don't have to worry about coats because <laughs> it is okay. wisconsin you know so it's like coats are a factor when you do stuff at, in uh in Anytime, anytime other than like summer, basically. And, and coat checks are weird, you know, like most of the time it works out, but um, I, I had a coat, um, you know, it's just like a black, it's L.L. Bean um, and pretty generic. Um, and I was like, but I knew it was mine because it was in the company I used to work for logo was on it where like a North Face logo would have been, you know, like the lapel yeah, yeah, or yeah. not lapel, whatever. Um, and so I was like, uh, I'm pretty sure the guy, because I found one that was like a black North Face, and I was like, pretty sure the guy who's this jacket, he took my jacket. Oh, uh, no. And so that was like a whole thing. I mean, I ended up getting it back, but yeah. it was like, you know, a whole big thing. <laughs> yeah. right. So, uh, you know, yeah, coat check is a, um, you know, unless you're doing the tabs, you know, where you people have to somebody has to go back into the back and like right it. right oh, well, you're, yeah, you're, oh, I well and also i mean like there you know a big part of the festival a big part of the festival is uh uh is the arcade and the pinball games and so you know doing um doing stuff outside uh would be a little bit risky because you never know you know when the weather's going to turn you never know exactly um what's going to happen and uh people a lot of the we do we do work with uh, um arcade game uh people who bring in the arcade games uh you know for, for a price but we also um uh, yeah i'm also besides being entrenched in the heavy metal community i'm also somewhat you know dipping my toe into the arcade and pinball and the classic video game community too i've been i go to you know all these shows all the time and i've, meet, I've met people um and so you know al along with giving space to up and coming bands. We also try our best to give space to um, independent uh, arcade game producers and pinball producers. So we have every year at the festival, we have a couple of machines that were created, you know, by a guy and the guy will be there, you know, standing next to his machine and is like, oh yeah, I made this arcade game in my, in my garage and there are 10 copies in the world and here's one of them. You know, um, or this is a pinball game that I, I produced myself and, you know, and it, and it works mostly <laughs> try it out, you know, so we, we try to give that opportunity too, and, um, and, you know, just allowing for uh, having power and doing all that sort of stuff um, makes it an, pretty much a necessity to have it inside of a venue, um, just to protect what, everybody's investment. What kind of insurance do you have to do this uh, kind of thing? Yeah, festival insurance uh, is a bit of a, a sticky 
uh, topic. Thankfully, so we we run a um, uh, so he, here in Madison, uh, there is this is going to be sort of a, a meandering answer to that. But here in Madison, there is a uh, a thing called the Madison Area Music Association or MAMA, and we are a nonprofit. Um, uh, we're a, a nonprofit board that puts that raises money for school music education and we put on big festivals and all that sort of stuff. So I'm one of the members of the board and I sit on the board with the CEO of um, another company in the town called Frank Productions, which is actually a rather large concert promoter and uh, and production uh, company. So that, like to give you a, an idea of their size, they did the last Metallica tour. So they're like they're pretty big. Um, and I've been very thankful to have them as a partner uh, for Mad with Power Fest. So we use, um, Frank Productions owns a lot of venues in the city. And so we use their venues. And because of that, thankfully, they handle the insurance uh, for the venue for the uh, for the for the stuff, yeah. Otherwise, it would be my my ticket sales astronomical. Yeah, and and uh, my ticket my ticket prices would probably be ten to fifteen dollars, you know, more expensive <laughs> if I had to do my own insurance. So. Yeah, I mean the prices. When I think of trying to put on something like this, it seems like the prices of the event would just drastically keep going up. I mean. Yeah. When you when you take into factors like safety and and hiring people to facilitate different activities and and things like that, there's a festival in town where I live called the uh, uh, Pickathon, and it's done on a farm outside of town. <laughs> and it's pretty it's pretty amazing, but they they uh, bring in uh, all kinds of different musicians at different levels, and and then they'll bring in some bigger groups like you'll see dinosaur jr or someone show and yeah and, uh, it's a pretty cool show but i i was thinking that maybe it would be more complicated to do this kind of thing inside a building like you're doing um i you know i think i think i actually i think it would it might be more difficult to just considering if you didn't already have a stage and a sound system there uh it might actually be more expensive to do it to do it outside because you have to build the stage, you have to get the sound system, you have to have somebody to run it. Whereas in these venues, uh, you usually already have that baked in, you know, because they're running live music, you know, seven nights a week. Um, so they they have a, a crew who knows how these things go and know how to run sound. You don't really have to build anything or hire anything out. We, we do bring in extra stuff and we do need to, you know, worry about power and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's not, it's not starting from scratch, you know, it's not starting from a field and building a, a festival. It's starting from like a place that does music and building a festival. So we're a little bit more lucky in that regard. Yeah, I mean, they even at this pickathon, they even have like babysitters. Wow. There. Oh, man. Yeah, it's pretty wild. <laughs> but yeah, you know, the, the, campground stuff, people camping out. Yeah, I've been to a lot of those fests and they're really fun. But yeah, you, like you said earlier, you know, the, the costs of running a festival uh, do tend to grow quite quickly uh, and that is something that you know I've been very it, it's something that I that I I as a band uh, as, as an entity that's sort of known inside of the heavy metal community you know not not to not to sound like I have a big head or anything but like we we are generally sort of kind of known by most people and so when we approach the bands to play the festival um, you know, we're not generally, we're not like talking to their manager or talking to their agent or talking to their record company. We're talking to them, you know, because we are n pretty much almost all of all the bands we know, we're friends with them. We have direct contacts with them. We have their emails. We're on Facebook, you know, with them. We've, you know, done meme wars with them on like certain pay, you know, stuff like that. So, we are able to come at it from a perspective of like, look, we're running this thing not for profit, basically. We just want to sell this thing out. We want to give you a good show. We want to give you a good breakfast and a place to sleep and to have you sell a ton of money, a ton of merchandise and make a ton of money. Um, we, we don't have thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to throw at every band that comes and plays. 
because because you know we are who we are and because uh, you know we are also a band um they are a lot more willing to come at that perspective of like oh you know ty's putting this on yeah we'll, we'll pay you know we'll do it for a thousand dollars yeah whatever or we'll do it for 400 or whatever um because we're able to tell them and we're able to show we have the logistics of the numbers we're like look every band that played mad with power last year made bare minimum eight hundred and fifty dollars at their merch booth bare minimum you know i like lords of the trident last year this this blows my mind right we, we're running this is our festival that we're running in our town and it's primarily like at least at least half of the people who come every single year are like our fans who already have all of our stuff and somehow we still made like twelve hundred dollars at our merch booth at the festival it's like you know, if we can do that in our city at our festival with people who have seen us a billion times before, like the bands that, that are coming in are going to make super bank. So, you know, it's coming from that perspective and being able to talk directly to the bands lowers that general price. But there's still, I mean, there's still all this stuff to worry about food and security and backline and paying the, the people at the venue and getting like curtains and dividers and uh, security stuff. I mean, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes on. Okay. Okay. Sounds like it. <laughs> we don't provide daycare quite yet, but maybe, maybe, maybe soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that just blew me away when I went to this festival and I saw that they did that. That was that was incredible. Yeah. And you could pay. You could pay for this weekend thing where you can camp out there. You know, it was pretty amazing. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I love camping oh, fest. For a festival. Was that Victor? For a festival. For a. For a. Yeah. You it's, got a, a link. I uh, oh two two link and both of that. One thing. Um, Ty, you were saying that, you know, nobody's doing the pinball and video game um, with heavy metal. Are people doing like, I mean, you may not know, but um, like, I, I would think that a more natural, of course, maybe, maybe the festival thing, you know, because it's a more probably more of an online scene, but I would think a more natural fit would be like retro wave, like electronic yeah. music um you know 8-bit stuff that that would be like a more natural fit for um an arcade sort of festival thing uh, are those things happening or um um you know i i do i love i love uh, synth wave i love retro you know and and everything everything sort of under the giant umbrella of like you know uh retro retro wave synth wave I, I love that stuff i absolutely adore it um i've gone to see the midnight you know twice i went to their third show ever i, I love i love that stuff um so yeah it's it's clearly it's clearly a perfect a match made in heaven but is anybody doing a festival about that with arcade games like specifically you know as part of the draw i i don't know i if there is i haven't heard of it i'd love if somebody did because like then i'd have somebody to commiserate with of like oh my god i can't find a freaking you know super mario cabinet to save my life or you know like all the terminator cabinets keep breaking all the time at my festival you know, oh me too you know but i yeah I'd, I'd, I'd love it if there was but i haven't heard about that i like it in my bed too um I have actually a whole bunch of stuff that I had written down. Well, I guess I, I've double spaced the, uh, so I guess I can do some quick math. I've got like 15 lines of stuff here. Um, but I kind of wonder if uh, we might just have like a part two of uh, a finding new music. Um, Sorry, I, don't know. I, I blabbed a lot. No, that's no, I mean, it's awesome <laughs> because it's like, um, you know you're a new voice and obviously like you're welcome to continue to um, we've been keeping them at the same time so it's it's pretty easy to um, you want to put any stickers on that jar um oh I, I this is like has nothing to do with music but um you're, you said you were doing taekwondo 
yep. um, this morning. Are you doing that online, or are you still able to do Taekwondo? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting a lot of the background noise, uh, like, popping in here. Yeah, Caleb, you got a lot of background noise, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had on. Yep. Okay. There we go. Uh, yeah. Taekwondo. <laughs> uh, yeah. Taekwondo. We are, we're doing all, um, all online. We're actually doing it over zoom. Um, you know, and I, I did, I, I, I missed this morning, uh, you know, cause I mean, last night's karaoke and I'm a little hungover. So, uh, you know, I, but you know, we, we are doing, yes, we're doing uh, Taekwondo all over zoom, uh, right now, um, which is a real, different and kind of new thing for us. Um, and surprisingly, it's actually been working out pretty well. Um, there, there's, a, there's a downside that, you know, teaching is difficult, you know. So I have some students that, um, you know, I can watch them do something and I can kind of tell them how to change, but I can't like be like, okay, take your arm and a little, little higher, like right here and then move it, you know, I can't like touch them over, <laughs> over Zoom, you know. So, um, uh, so yeah, we, we've been doing everything remotely and, and the plan is, um, to continue to do that until about August. Um, the Taekwondo community that I am involved in here and I have been involved in for, uh, geez, I think I'm going on 15 years, maybe, maybe longer, um, here in Madison, uh, is, is tied to the university. Um, so it was a, it was a, uh, Taekwondo group that I joined when I was uh, a freshman in college and I've just continued uh, going forward and what we do is we offer our classes for free um, and so we there's no charge to join the club there's never a charge to do anything in the club uh, and the way that you give back uh, is that when you get to those higher belt levels when you get to you know uh, uh, the blue belt and the, and the black belt and that kind of stuff and red belt you teach right so you give back you you take on students and you teach um, so uh, because we are connected with the UW Madison community because we are a UW Madison club uh, UW Madison has basically come out and said hey no in-person meetings for any student organizations of any type until the end of uh until the end of july so yeah at the moment we are uh at the moment we are all digital which has been weird but it's it's worked and you know we're still able to <laughs> still able to work out you know i have I, i'm not quite 400 pounds yet but you know quarantine has done a little bit of a number on the old uh, on the old jowls here so hopefully i can lose some weight <laughs> get back to fighting for them you know do you have any cauliflower ears you could show us no, thankfully, uh, Taekwondo, we don't do a whole lot of ground uh, uh, work and any, um, any attacks to the head are usually either we have, you know, padded stuff on the head or we, or we, we stop it an inch from, from hitting somebody. So we don't, it, there's not a lot of full contact in our club um, going on. It's not really a, a lot about that. It's more about sort of, you know, learning and, and growing, you know, personally. Um, we're not, we're not a very competitive club. We don't do a whole lot of, um, we don't do a whole lot of like tournaments and stuff like that. My, my family has a lot of professional fighters. That's why oh, I'm yeah. just curious. <laughs> <laughs> no, my ears are very normal. So, you know, I'm, I'm. <laughs> That's too bad. Cauliflower ears are real good looking. I mean, you know, look. you know, you, it, it's definitely a way to make a statement. We'll say that, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a bummer that um, the Ben couldn't come. I I think he might do jujitsu, but he does he does martial arts or did before. I don't know if he's still doing stuff online. Uh, but yeah, you guys probably could have talked about that. Um, <laughs> I, if you said anything about this, I spaced out. Um, but what is the status of? Or it probably it's just wait and see. But um, of mad with power considering all of the like yeah yeah that i mean that has been weighing pretty heavily on my mind uh during the whole of, uh, of quarantine um because there were there were when this whole thing started you know my the the initially all the bands were like well, what are, what are we gonna do and and my my thought was my what i told them is like look guys it's six months out I'm pretty sure we'll have a plan in place by then. I'm pretty sure everything will be 
fine. I, like if we're not back to normal in six months, we're going to have bigger problems to worry about than, you know, running a music festival. We're going to have pe jobless people like, you know, running in the streets, looting and pillaging. I mean, you know, and thankfully I have so many swords in this house being in a, in a power metal band that like, you know, I'm, I'm prepared for the looting and pillaging. I'm ready. Um, but but yeah, uh, as the time has gone on and as, as things have gotten, you know, maybe not better, I don't want to say worse, but not better. Um, and as we've seen all of these other festivals, major festivals, um, clo you know, stopping and closing their doors uh, for this year or moving things to next year, uh, it's been it's been tough. I'll, I'll tell you what. When when Wacken in Germany, you know, the world's biggest heavy metal yeah. festival in the entire world, when Wacken closed down, that made me go, "Oh, that's not good." You know, that was a real wake up call for me. So, the what we're gonna do right now, you know, it's May second as we're talking at the moment. I told the bands I'm going to wait until the end of May, and and I'm gonna make a call. Uh, and we're going to see where things are at and we're going to see where the country is, is at. Um, I, I will be able to sort of do all the final finishing touches and put everything together in two months. I don't want to. I wish I could have, you know, been working this whole time with the intent of like, Mad of Power is definitely happening. But, um, you know, anything closer than two months, you know, I, I don't want to cancel the festival at the in the middle of like July. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's you know, and and if the festival gets canceled there, I will take a pretty significant uh, financial hit um, personally, just because I have a lot of money invested in this year already. But I'm, you know, thankfully the band uh, Lords of the Trident has um, an incredible amount of support on Patreon uh, and, you know, just crowdfunding in general. And so, you know, because, because of that, I am able to make that tough call and say like, yeah, we will lose three grand, four grand if we, if we close this year, but, um, or if we move it, you know, uh, but we could theoretically use some of the Patreon money, some of the band fund money to sort of soften that blow. So it's not just me, you know, T taking digging digging out of my empty pockets and being like you know oh, i've got 25 cents let's let's see how far can we rub this so you know, how much blood can we get out of this stone um yeah so uh, it, it it is it is wait and see um and i'm and i'm hopeful that you know that things will start to return back to normal i'm hopeful we'll have better testing uh i'm hopeful that you know maybe uh, more treatment options will come out um it, it is a, a, a heavy concern uh, on my mind. I think if I wasn't running a music festival, um, the, the biggest thing I'd be concerned about is like, uh, I can't see my guys and I can't practice. And I'm, and I'm one, I'm one drum track. I'm one percussion track away from finishing, finishing the next acoustic album. And it's been sitting in my computer for the last like eight weeks. You know, it's like, come on, I just need to record one freaking drum part and it's done. <sighs> So anyway, that's <laughs> that would be my big worry. But yeah, Mad of Power is on, on the list of those worries and probably at the top, yeah. Have is it possible? Oh, sorry. Doug. No, go ahead, Caleb. Is it possible to do anything online? That's exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> oh, do you mean do you mean about Mad of Power? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's so many I've seen so many online concerts lately. Mm -hmm. They've been pretty interesting. It is, and I think so the 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 issue is, right, is that, um, and I actually just came out with a video. I, so I run a, I run a, a, a video series on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Swords of the Trident, called Words of Fang, which are, is like a DIY focused um, advice sort of column for, for bands. And the, and the one that I just did is like how to make your live streams look and sound as professional as possible. And so, you know, could, could something like that be applied with Mad, to Mad with Power? Theoretically, yeah, it could. But the, the stipulation of that is that you have to have a number of bands that are like technically, you know, technically minded enough to get good video, record good audio, mix it all together, you know, put it, put it together. And, and like, I mean, let's be honest, about 95% of the live streams that we're seeing happening on like Facebook or YouTube or whatever, it's like a dude sitting in front of his webcam with an acoustic guitar 
and it it sounds all right but it doesn't sound amazing you know and i i i've i've I, 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 everything that we do in Lords of the Trident and everything that we do at Mad with Power Fest, I try to have a a level of quality that I will never ever dip under, you know. And I'm afraid that if we leave a number of these bands to their own devices, and you know, say, yeah, let's do a live stream, that it's going to be like a garbled mess, and people, and it'll come out wrong, you know. I I'm one of those guys that like to have absolute total control. <laughs> you know, over the, th over the things that I do in the yeah. festivals and stuff like that. I don't so. know if Ty ever said this, but he's the lead singer. So yes, I am. The lead <laughs> I assume that otherwise I don't think he would have been going on so long at the, uh, yeah, karaoke. at the karaoke. Yeah. Fair, fair <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Karaoke. I think I would have fled by, by that. Yeah. The, oh, I yeah. guess the, the other, uh, the other option would be lead guitarist, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's an option, you know, I've, the one that I saw that was really good, speaking of Synthwave, uh, there's, uh, the, the Midnight put on a COVID-19 fundraiser called One Beating Heart, uh, and they did, it was sort of, sort of kind of a live stream, like all the performances were multicam like we're doing right now, and they were all pre-recorded. Uh, so, and, and so they, they kind of like would play the video file of them of what they had done pre-recorded. Um, and that was, that was cool. Um, but, you know, I mean, like anybody's savvy enough to know anything about, you know, playing together in like a Zoom call knows that it's pretty much impossible. Um, so, you know, y like it's not live and it's not the same feeling as like standing, you know, in front of a stage and like giving the lead singer a high five. You know, it's uh, so, yeah, I could do something digitally, but. I would probably, if I did something digitally, I'd probably do like a fundraiser and I'd probably do it for, for free and just let people donate what they could. Um, yeah. And I mean, we kind of, you know, that's kind of what we're doing with Patreon anyway, is, you know, like if, if you want to donate, if you want to help us out as a band as, and you want to help, help the festival too, I mean, yeah, jump on the Patreon. Sweet. Um, I kind of, uh, said this earlier and i don't even know what i did to get us uh where where i took it from when i when i mentioned this um but uh oh i think i, I think i passed it over to, to caleb and then he had some questions but um i wanted to uh to uh see if caleb and victor if you guys were um cool with just sort of um talking more at some point about finding new music um another time we vote every week for uh um for the uh for the uh topic so we do that in two places uh we do this actually started out of my uh out of my employer so like the first week it was just people from my employer and gotcha. now um they've all the all, none of them are here today but um so we vote in a slack channel at work and then this week uh i just started um a vote a separate vote i mean you know the votes are like it's addition it's not hard you know <laughs> add. um so i just i started another one in the um cc community music awards um in the facebook group which caleb and victor are both um judges this year so um and we're uh last year as well um so um so yeah those are the two votes so um, who knows what it'll be in a couple of weeks times. Like I said, it's sampling, but, uh, maybe we can get new music, um, back on the, um, or not new music, finding new music on mm. back on the uh, agenda one week. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, unless Victor, Caleb, you guys want to, um, to talk a bit more. Um, I, uh, I've ridden like over 200 kilometers on my bike. Um, Today, yeah, this morning and yesterday morning so for wow. entirely different reasons i probably feel a lot like ty does oh, at the moment um <laughs> so i've i've uh you know drained all of the fluids that are like within reach of me um so i probably should go get some more at some point but uh i don't want to cut it um short if you guys wow look at that oh it's a little bit no, that's okay with me. Uh, it kind of like we ended up talking about uh, festivals and things yeah, like that today, yeah, which think, was fine. Yeah, it was a really. Like, good I didn't really nothing I voted for got picked this week, so 
I'm, I'm good yeah. with festivals talk for this yeah. one. Sorry, guys. I, you know, I didn't mean to bother. Oh, no, no, no. You're great. What a great <laughs> guest to have yeah. this week. So, yeah. And like I said, Ty, um, very know, interesting. It's, it's noon um, every, every Sunday. If we ever get enough people to start breaking it into two, we might do that. Because I have had some people in Europe that have requested that we do it um, earlier. And then I know that we did it earlier the first week, um, and Caleb wanted to do it later. So it's kind of like, you know, maybe if those people actually showed up once and then they were like, okay, I'm committed to this. I do actually show up. Then I'd be like, all right, let's like switch it every other week and stuff. But as it is, it's like, well, Caleb's showing up every week. So, um, you know, I don't want to make it tough for Caleb. Um, of course, Victor is a trooper. It's probably like midnight there now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Victor, um, what time is it over there now? Oh my God. It's midnight. Oh man. Yeah. No. Um, Victor's a rock star. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I think, uh, Victor, um, did you have anything you want to say about festivals or about finding new music before we call it quits? I don't, don't think so. There is not, not so many festivals in Kazakhstan. Yeah, yeah. I know that you, um, you, there, you've talked about a couple, though. Um, so and we've got the uh the 4e dot uh kz the link that's the last one that's still up there so um oh cool i am uh first thing i'm gonna do is i'm gonna 